Right, hello everyone. JFocus is, is uh, closing in on the last two sessions, uh, but we're not quite quite ready to close down yet. Uh, let's all give a warm welcome to Stian that's going to talk to us about bad code and how to avoid it. Testing, testing. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stian Granbergen, and I'm working for Sorprastera here in Stockholm, a consultancy agency with 400 developers in Scandinavia, and I will be talking about the uncomfortable truth of bad code. While still studying computer science at university, I was working on a free open source game called FreeCode, and I especially enjoyed solving the more complicated problems like pathfinding, transportation algorithms, and artificial intelligence. After ending my work on that project, I still kept an eye on various ongoing developments. What I especially enjoyed watching was how a piece of complicated, yet beautifully elegant code that I'd written became the talk on the developer's mailing list, with people thinking it was overly complex and in dire need of refactoring. Of course, I knew better, and in the beginning, I boasted my own ego by telling them why the code needed to stay as is, why it was complex, and why only the properly skilled, like me, should be working on the complex parts of the code. After a while of not looking into the project, I found out that many of those places had been rewritten anyway. Looking back on the commit history and mailing list, I found out that the team now consisted of new developers not being a party to the previous discussion on the mailing list, and therefore not understanding how beautiful that code really was. Idiots. The initial attempts at refactoring introduced loads of hard to debug problems from various corner cases and the resulting code being either as complicated or worse than my initial code. Some places this cycle of oversimplifying had been repeated multiple times. This discovery, of course, inflated my ego enormously. None of the other developers were as good as me. That is, until I started thinking and came to the conclusion that this was actually my fault. Simply put, I was only thinking of solving the problem and of the intrinsic qualities of the code and not as I should have on the developers reading that code in the future. I could have avoided all that duplicate effort by a simple comment describing why an obviously simpler solution would not suffice. In some cases, I could even have written unit tests uh, for the specific use cases, forcing the code into its more complex form. A lot of really bad code is being produced by really bad developers as a consequence of people concentrating on what an application should do and how it should do it and not focusing on why, or by not communicating the reason why to future developers and making the code seem overly complex and indistinguishable from bad code. And I'll tell you what happened to code that's indistinguishable from bad code. It will be treated like bad code. It will either be rewritten and thereby losing some key aspects of the original solution, or it will be patched in all sorts of horrible ways in order to handle new requirements and corner cases. After a while, it doesn't matter if the code was intrinsically good at the beginning. For all practical purposes, it was bad code right from the start. Understanding why something has been written greatly simplifies understanding the important parts of what's being implemented and how it's solved. Not knowing why something was written can make it almost impossible to separate intentional behavior from bugs or clutter. What is bad code? Code that has negative impact for no obvious reason. Notice reason. You might have totally unreadable and highly efficient code with a good interface, with an explanation why the solution needs to be highly efficient and a clear definition of what's being done. Yet it's highly time-consuming time to find out how it's actually solved. Is that bad code for simply being unreadable? Of course not. It might, however, be bad code if the efficiency was not required. Similarly, what's the problem if the code is highly unreadable, yet no one should actually read it? For example, would you spend time making your terminal commands more readable? Good code has good reasons for accepting the negative impact caused by code in certain areas. Bad code does not. Forgetting to ask why when writing code might trick you into using all sorts of best practices that doesn't apply for your specific case and that needlessly overcomplicates the solutions. 
One of the hallmarks of hilariously bad code is doing stuff for no obvious reason. Yet that's exactly what many developers do, dragging in frameworks, libraries, and middleware they don't need, adding layers with no discernible benefits, and so on. And yet, it seems they do this in order to avoid writing bad code, to ensure the quality of the code. Often developers choose technologies they have absolutely no prior knowledge of because it's somehow branded as the correct choice. And when first trying a new technology, they will undoubtedly make newbie mistakes. Making some newbie mistakes is acceptable if the case for using that technology was sound. Yet often it's not. It's driven by hype, it's driven by fear, or being caught writing bad code as you're not using the latest and greatest. Before solving a problem, you need to understand why a problem needs to be solved. You need to have a reason. An example. Consider the following application design. A data object layer for communicating with a database. A business object layer for implementing business functionality. A composed business object layer for implementing business functionality based on other business functionality. An application object layer for implementing application-specific logic, that is, functionality that's not connected to the traditional domain model. An application coordination layer for handling whatever does not fit in any other layer. I worked on several systems structured like this, and this is just the server side. Some systems had Java client applications connecting to the server. In one instance, there was a client-server combo within total nine layers. This was not just a classification of objects, it was actually actual layers with value objects and services. When asking why a solution like this was chosen, I got replies like, we just needed some sort of top-level architecture, or even better, a really good consultant said so. That's not reasons, that's excuses. Most of the logic in the application was just calling the layer below. A few developers had taken shortcuts, as they could not understand why the layers existed at all. And soon, you had the same functionality being re-implemented closer and closer and closer to the data object layer, with a wrecked five-layer duplication achieved. Trying to find out why someone would create a system like this, I found a suggested architecture from IBM and various standards popular in the end of the 90s. Yet, it was only a tool for the classification of the object. It was no actual layers in those proposals. This misunderstanding became a mandated architecture everyone should follow in several organizations, even if it didn't seem to have any value whatsoever. If the code you're writing should be read and possibly modified by others, you should not un only understand why you chose the solution you did, you also need to explain why to future developers. As an example, imagine you have two parts of an application interacting through a message queue. The what and how it's done might be abundantly clear from the code, yet there's no way to find out why it was done. Perhaps it's because of availability of some resource. Perhaps it's because the data should always be accepted and manually fixed in case of errors. Or perhaps the developer just needed message queue on their CD. Without explaining why, how can you ensure the code can evolve safely? How can a maintenance developer refactor and improve that code? Often, programmers document why a piece of functionality was written as a part of a commit message or in a tracker. Do you honestly believe that maintenance developers will be reading the commit log or the various items on the tracker, unless perhaps as a last-ditch effort? Now that we have discussed the importance of explaining why, let's discuss the negative impact caused by certain solutions in the code. Why is it important to consider the impact when labeling code as good or bad? It's because people confuse what's stupid to initially write and what warrants fixing, rewriting, and refactoring at a later stage. Doing stuff for no obvious reason is a waste of time and frequently referred to as really bad code. Yet how bad is it really? Code that's only laughable is not a huge problem, as you easily know what it is. Like this code for handling leap years in a Java application which would have caused an incident in year 2044 if the code was still running at that time. Still, it's easy to understand and fix. Yes, the code is practically broadcasting the news that the developer who wrote it is far from skilled, but should that be the definition of bad code? That 
we can see that someone is lacking in skills. That's a very unproductive way of looking at bad code, as it makes programmers nervous to participate in code reviews, as they might be defined as bad programmers. And how can we expect to get time and money for fixing bad code if our explanation is, it's a stupid way of doing it, rather than explaining the actual negative impact? It's like a journalist asking for money to heighten the literary quality of a newspaper by rewriting everything into the form of Shakespearean verse. I'm thinking code can be hilariously stupid and still quite good, or really clever and be the worst possible code imaginable. This might be an uncomfortable way of looking at it, as it means everyone has the potential to write really bad code, and that your worst code might actually be the one you're the most proud of. Now let's take a look at when the purpose of an application changes and how that the reasons why you chose a specific design might no longer apply. We'll start directly with an example. The task being solved is rather simple. Transfer data from system A to system B using FTP. Curious as to how it's actually solved. When you want to transfer data from system A to system B, you start by storing the data in database tables. Then call a PLSQL procedure with 200 lines that utilizes a custom queue implementation using ordinary database tables. Then a database scheduler on another database instance calling a database procedure with 100 lines that utilizes a PLSQL package with 1,300 lines and a function with 200 lines in order to pull the data stored in the custom queue mentioned on the previous slide. Stores the resulting data in an Oracle advanced queue. The custom queue implementation was obviously no longer good enough for this crucial step. A Windows scheduler executing a Windows batch script with 100 lines that runs the SQL plus executable PDSQL files with 30 lines and uses this to generate a Windows batch file and executes the generated file. Then a PLSQL file having 100 lines going back to the original database since we didn't get all the data we needed from the Oracle advanced queue. Now finally, we are using FTP to transfer data. Now we need to find out if the file transfer was actually completed. In order to do that, we execute a Perl script with 20 lines, and afterwards we can update the status flag in various tables using the SQL pl uh, plus executable again with a PLSQL file with 10 lines. In total, there are more than 2,000 lines of code just moving stuff around. You might think it's done now, but the FTP target is not actually system B. It was only a stage in the entire process. Before actually moving the data into the recipient's FTP server, there's an unknown amount of extra service and logic containing at least form and transformation on a mainframe system. There's also a similar, yet totally separate flow for receipts. The solution was not created by a lone pri bad programmer. It was a team effort. Getting the solution took many different developers working over many years. Digging into the code base revealed a 20-year-old history for various parts of the code. The current incarnation of the code was a result from moving the scheduler code from cron on Solaris to Windows Scheduler. Almost every absurd solution was the shortest path for the problem being solved. Refactoring would have cost extra time and money and was rejected. In this company, the time being spent on every individual incident and problem have been logged for years. It's actually quite easy to find out that the yearly cost of generated incidents and problems was higher than the estimated cost for a complete rewrite. And it stayed that way for several years until most of the bugs were ironed out. Then why wasn't the code rewritten? The reason seems to be that the developers laughed at the code, talked about how terrible it was, yet never tried to communicate that actual cost of that bad code, even when the data to do so was so accessible. And with the business people thinking the developers are just complaining about ugly code as usual. Having a climate like that seemed to be the root cause of extremely bad code. Code so bad that an incompetent programmer simply would not be able to make it work. Keep in mind, while bad developers can certainly write really bad code, the good developers are much better at it. Most developers think the business people are to blame when stuff like this happens, yet the blame could just as appropriately be placed on the programmers as they most certainly have advocated rewrites when there was no actual value. How can that, how's that for establishing trust in your organization? To summarize, you should understand why, preferably with reasons directly based on actual business value, explain why, and have trust and cooperation within your organization. And if you like this and want to know more, want to know, see more examples, why I came to the conclusions I did, we have a full presentation, May the 12th, at Superstera, just here by Kungsbron.
Thank you.